you had given me some head start. <laughs> Very short introduction. My classmates. <laughs> my my uh, a classmate from Achimota School. Then we went to US on the same plane, you know, the same program, we were on the same program, the ASPAR program, you know, those days it was called the African Scholarship Program for American Universities, ASPAR. You know, so we were on the same program. And uh, he went to Berkeley, and then uh, I went to Columbia. And uh, uh, in fact, Vice President Engineer Sarabo was also a classmate at Achimota School. And I've often maintained that that group of 19 kids who were in what was called the engineering class in Achimota, I don't think you find, you know, uh, 19 kids who are as good in maths and science. <laughs> <laughs> That year, I think the the A's w were flying all over the place. You know, they're flying all over the place. And uh, I give a little story. You know, when we went to, you know, <laughs> I, I I tell the story. When uh, we got to, we landed in Boston. You know, we went to Ghana. In fact, we went to meet the Nigerian crew. It was like a, a trotro plane, bringing African students. You know, they chartered a plane and took all of us to the U.S. and we landed in, uh, you know, Boston. You know, and if I remember very clearly, you know, today, us uh, then. And you know, we got there and all these flyovers. That was the time that they were trying to build the overhead, you know, at a uh, circle, and they had spent months. And you know, I'm not making much progress. And he went then all over the place. And I said, hey, this place is developed. <laughs> <laughs> so we get to the uh, airport. And then, of course, all these automatic doors. And uh, some of us trying to open the doors, <laughs> falling down through the. <laughs> <laughs> and I've often wondered the immigration officers, you know that uh, day when they went home, the story they must have told their, their families. <laughs> you know that? Uh, honey, you won't believe what I saw today. <laughs> but uh, anyway, so they took us to this uh, place uh, called Patni Vermont for orientation. You know, and uh, you know, these guys from Ghana who had arrived, you know, and they gave us some pocket money, so we were able to buy these uh, t-shirts and Bermuda shorts, and those days they had these uh, socks called Esquire socks, and then we had bought these sneakers, and we were feeling very, very good, you know, and the barbecue, and actually gave you, what, half a piece of chicken, <laughs> you know, can you imagine, things, yeah, something, you know, Christmas, you get some small piece, <laughs> <laughs> you know, then, then my my dear friend here was feeling even cooler, you know, and uh, with a fancy name like Crookshank. And those of us who are the Boachis and the Osus, he said, if it weren't for you guys, everybody was, would think I was American, you know. He <laughs> <laughs> <I> said, <laughs> you, you guys with funny names, don't follow me. <laughs> But the more interesting thing is that when we went to school, those days we used to actually write letters. You know, I mean, some of you remember that there's something called letter writing. Then uh, my dear friend wrote to me, and he signed his name, not Crookshank, but Odate. And I knew exactly what had happened to him. <laughs> he, he, he had learned that being American wasn't such a great but anyway, more to the point, uh, I think we are lucky to have one of the Wells authorities uh, on uh, compressors. As I said, uh, Joe went to you know, Berkeley, you know, uh, did his undergraduate work at uh, Berkeley. Uh, you 
you did your master's there too. Yeah, Mas yeah, I did a master's in uh, aeronautical engineering at uh, Berkeley. Then he came to KNUSD to teach. You know, so some of you probably were his students. You know, yeah, and uh, <laughs> he flew in fluid dynamics. I think some of you, you know, so uh, if if you harbored any evil ill, this is the time to take. <laughs> He's here. Yeah, and then uh, went to do a PhD, you know. Tech, I think uh, those days, Ghana was very tough for all of us, you know. So he went to do, you know, a PhD. Uh, and then worked in many places, but very notably with uh, General Electric. You know, he was, I mean, you know, in those companies, when you advance to the highest level of uh, the technical leader, ladder, they call you consultant. And he was a consultant, you know, in General Electric's, you know. <laughs> and, you know. I mean, and clearly, you know, he was the one who was the authority on compressors in, uh, you know, General Electric. So we are really very fortunate to have him share his experience with us. So this is more than just sort of the usual, you know, technical talks. It will be technical but also sharing, you know, his career experience, you know, with us. You know. So, Joe, on that note, may I call? Uh, no, please let me finish. So, may I call on Odate? <laughs> yeah. 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 So, may I call on him to? share with us uh, so it's, it's a pleasure to be here um, some of you I know very well Alex for example has been like was a student was a, a student and has been a friend for years now. So it's always a pleasure to come here. And uh, I, I, I see that he's going to be the future president of the Ghana Institute of Engineers. President elect, yeah. So, yeah, so I think I can take some small credit for that. I hope. <laughs> <laughs> on the other hand, if things don't work out, don't blame me. It's all on him, okay? So, uh, but indeed, um, I, I, I went to Kwame and Kuru at Achimana School. And we all went to America, like he said. I'm not going to bore you with some of the details, but. In terms of the cultural shock uh, that he, you know, he was referring to, there's one experience that he didn't tell you about because he wasn't there. So we're on this bus heading, I was on this bus, I say, heading to Chicago. And uh, it was a sort of a night trip. So in the morning we stopped for, for breakfast. And we went to this restaurant, I looked at the menu, and uh, honestly, I couldn't recognize anything on the menu. When you are used to, used to eating cocoa and bread. <laughs> there's nothing on the menu, so I figured, you know, egg and something, maybe sausage or something will do. So the waitress comes over and I said, I'll have egg and sausage and toast. So she asked me, uh, how do you want your egg fried? Now I'm saying to myself, how do you fry an egg? <laughs> <laughs> Just fry an egg. <laughs> so I said, okay, uh, what do you mean? He said, do you want a sunny side up? You know, hard boiled? You know, uh, easy, over by easy? I mean, there were like 15 different ways to prepare an egg. And that's when I said to myself, you know, this was quite creative. And I don't want to, you know, I, I think to some extent, that is what captures the American spirit. They never, ever stop innovating. And, you know, every, everything can be improved. And so to, to the extent I can leave you guys with a message, it is that everything can be improved. The 2019 cars are out now, but the 2020... So, yeah, uh, and while the 2020s are coming, the 2021s are coming, and they are better and better and better. And so to the extent that we engineers in Ghana can acquire this spirit, that nothing, no project is ever yeah. Okay. Uh, no design is ever finished. You know, kind of like, oh, we are done, this is it, no more improvement. We will all be doing ourselves and our country a lot of good. So that's one message I want to leave with you 
It is nothing is ever completely finished as a design, as an engineering design can always be improved. And in fact, at GE, one of the things we had to do was every year, these compressors, you were tasked with improving efficiency by say a quarter or a half percent. And you had to do it. It was part of the evaluation. So it was never finished, never done, constantly. You can acquire that uh, attitude. I think you'll all be better off and the country will be better off. Okay. So what I'm gonna talk about um, today is, as I said, it's like a conversation. I'm not gonna, I hope, I don't think there's a single equation on the, on the, uh, on, on the, on the slide. Uh, what I'm gonna do is kind of give you like what we would do when somebody comes for a tour on the plant. So we take them through, we show them the various uh, impellers and compressors and what they look like and why they are the way they are. And then um, after that, I can talk about maybe how you design, how the design compressors are designed. Uh, in general, everybody who's, I, I think I can say this, everybody who took my fluid mechanics course at, at, at Tech probably had the, 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 the theory of how you design compressors. And you know pretty much 80% of what it takes. The problem with, uh, with industry is that, is that that last 10%, <laughs> which is built experience and failures and going back to the, to the you know, and so uh, to the extent that I can share some of those experiences with you, I think maybe we might all uh, learn something. So, so I'll sit down now and uh, go over the slides. Oh, okay, yeah. Oh, oh, yeah, but uh, is somebody gonna control for me? Oh, this will control, okay. Yeah, you see, I'm <laughs> high tech, I'm, I'm not that familiar with high tech. So, uh, it's not working. I'm sorry? So as I said, um, this is like a conversation. Um, in generally, generally speaking, there are several types of, uh, yes. Okay, thank you, yeah. Yeah. You know, so the principal compressor ties, which again, you probably would have seen in the classes you took at, at Tech, would be, you know, you've got uh, the positive displacement types, which are the reciprocating compressors. So if you've been to a chassis, not a chassis, sorry, uh, the gas, the gas power plant, a trouble? A trouble. Yes, I believe they have reciprocating compressors there. I f believe so. I was on a website, and that's, sorry. Okay, okay, yeah, okay, yes. So, um, you know, you've got the positive displacement types, like the, the reciprocating type that you have at uh, a trouble. Um, and basically, they, they, they generate intermittent flow, because it's really nothing more, it's like, Internal combustion engine, basically just, you know, just going up and down and creating the pressure. Internal combustion engine, essentially, the reverse design, generating power instead of having power put into it. Then you've got, um, so of those uh, positive displacement types, there are reciprocating types, which is what I'm talking about. And then there are uh, rot rotary kinds also. There's a sliding vein, the helical vein, helical loop, sorry, and a straight loop. The area where I was working was in the continuous flow um, areas, that is centrifugal type compressors, okay? And uh, those are called dynamic for obvious reasons. There's centrifugal, there's mixed flow, and there's axial flow, um, okay? Now, this is roughly speaking how you, how you select the type of compressor that you are gonna use. So obviously for very low flows, now flow coefficient is a non-dimensional parameter for, for flow, so. Um, so you start out with the reciprocating, very, very sort of high pressure ratio uh, applications, but not much flow, you know. So depending upon the flow that you have, which are very low flow, but you want very high pressures, you are going with the reciprocating types. Then coming down the line, you have the rotary lobe, and then, you know, at somewhere around here, you get the centrifugal uh, types. Now, the difference between this and this, the mixed flow obviously is higher, higher flow. So you go from what I'll call the axial exit to, uh, to the mixed flow type of compressor, where basically what's happening is that the, the impeller is kind of laid back a little bit. 
and then you get to the axial. And so basically, you know, you can, the, 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 uh, depending upon the flow, uh, you have, you know, sort of uh, either ag uh, radial exit, mixed flow, or, or, or axial. As you can see, you don't get much uh, pressure rise per stage for an axial compressor, but you can pass a lot of flow. If you want to have a lot of pressure, then for an axial flow, you may, I mean, for an axial compressor, you may end up with 10, 12, 13, 14, whatever number of stages. So it's a lot more stages. Um, you know, typically, the mixed flows are single stages, but it may be the, the single stage, the first stage on a multi-stage application. Okay. And, and please, um, as I said, this is a conversation. So if something doesn't make, if, if something is not clear, I think we can ask questions as we go along. Yeah. Okay, so don't, don't, don't hesitate. Okay. So the, the impeller types that typically are used in centrifugal compressors are, this, this is a low flow coefficient, oops, sorry, sorry, sorry. Typically, this uh, here is a two, what we call a two-dimensional impeller. And basically, by two dimensions, we mean the blade itself has no variation in the, in the Z direction. It's, if you imagine a flat plate, a flat blade that you just, you know, turn like, like a circle, you know, and just weld it on the, onto, the, onto the hub, that's what they call a 2D. So in a Z direction, there's no variation in the, in the profile of the blade. Then you go to the, to the next one here, which is the beginning you know, of, the, of, the two, two, of, the, of the 3D or the end of the 2D. And it may have a bit of a twist to it, or it may not. In fact, when we would design a 2D impeller, they, they tended to look like this. So this built of these in the two-dimensional impellers. Then you go further on, and you would have the 3D. A 3D basically means, you know, on every surface on the, on the impeller, uh, there's an ROZ theta coordinate that defines it. And it, it's, it changes from, you know, it, it's, it's twisted, essentially. I have some pictures that I think, uh, this one, this one will be an you know, extreme case of the uh, 3D. And it is not mixed flow. As you can see, the, 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 the blade is vertical at the tip there. So, you know, if it's mixed flow, the blade tends to lie at an angle, you know, going as, as, you, as you go to the, to the hub, okay? So this is a typical 2D impeller. And as you can see, it's very simple. And this is one of the things that uh, I want to emphasize to, I don't know how many young engineers are in here, but sometimes, <laughs> sometimes you know, we get so caught up in the calculations that we do that we come up with complicated designs when a very simple one will do. And in this case, for example, with a typical 2D uh, impeller, low flow coefficient impeller, the fri friction on the, on the hub and the cover chew up a lot of your performance. So you spend a lot of time designing these blades and making them very, very sophisticated, you know, with you know, changes in the blade thickness from beginning to end. And you run it, and the performance you get from that complicated design you made, compared to something that is this simple, we say half a percent. <laughs> and the cost of making that complicated impeller may be, I don't know, $40,000 versus this one which may be 10. So one of the things that I learned is that we engineers, I mean, this happens to all of us. In school, we demand perfection, you know, in your calculations. But in the real world, you, you, you are lots of compromises that you have to make for cost and so on. So you may end up with a design that is not necessarily the best, but it may be the one that's easiest to manufacture, is the cheapest, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So we always need to have that in mind, that what we learn in school in terms of sophisticated calculations and so on, there's nothing wrong with that. But in the real world, you might have to begin to ask yourself, you know, all these calculations and all these things I'm doing, are they really worth the effort? If it's gonna add $50,000 per cost, and you cannot sell it to anybody, <laughs> is it really worthwhile, okay? Now, uh, let me go back. As I said, this is an open impeller. So by open, we mean the blades are what we call the hub. There's no cover, okay? So, um, and I, I'll show you later, basically, that you can, I mean, you, one would say that, okay, the gas comes through here, and what happens to it? But the, the, it, it sort of sits against, you know, the, 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 the inside of the compressor. So it, it, there is a cover, but the cover is not attached to the blade. On the other hand, this is a covered impeller. So the same impeller could have a cover on it. And the question then that arises is, why do you want to choose one or the other? This, for example, is one that you might use if the process is dirty. 
So if you know if you have maybe a shop compressor or something where you know you, you get dirty air coming through or something and you know it builds up on the impellers and so on, you may want an open one that you can take it out and clean it. This one, obviously you cannot clean this one so easily. Now, between this one and the next one, because there's no cover, you can also run it at a typically higher uh, RPM. This one, if you try to run it at very high RPMs, the cover may very well fly off. So again, there are mechanical, I mean, there are considerations other than aerodynamics that determine the final design that you are going to use. You know? So again, I just want to keep pointing out that um, you, you don't necessarily have to go for the ultimate in the design. You have to go for the design that works for the circumstances you find yourself in. So you may choose an open impeller or a covered one, depending upon not aerodynamic considerations, <laughs> but whether there's going to be a dirty gas or whether uh, the, the um, you know uh, the, the tip speed is too high and the cover will fly off. And all these things are, have nothing to do with aerodynamics; they are more mechanical uh, considerations. Again, this is an open 3D impeller. I mean, was, you saw what I was talking about as far as 3D impeller is concerned. See how the blade is twisted? So that's what a 3D impeller will look like. And again, this is an open impeller. And we also can cover them. And again, the decision basically depends on the application, uh, the tip speeds, and stuff like that. Because this cover is welded onto the blades. Okay? And so at very high speeds, the thing can basically fly off. So in an application like this, you are limited to the tip speed. Generally speaking, some like this, you probably wouldn't run it more than, say, 1,000 uh, feet per second at the tip. Okay. And this is a mixed flow impeller. Now, the picture doesn't you know, show it, but as I said, the, the, the thing that distinguishes a mixed flow impeller from a, a regular 3D impeller is the angle of the, of the, of the hub. So the, the hub kind of lays down a little bit. Uh, when, when I used to work on these things, typically about 20 to 25 degrees is what, what we, would, we would choose. Now, typically, centrifugal compressors uh, can, be, can be classified in two different groups, single-stage uh, compressors and multi-stage compressors. Now, there are, again, several reasons for choosing one or the other. If you have only so much head, let's say 12,000 feet of head, 13,000 feet of head, you might be able to do it in a single-stage application. Okay? But if you have 70,000 feet of head, you can't. Uh, the reason is, I mean, the head you produce is proportional to the tip speed squared of the, of the impeller. So if you are going to get 70,000 feet of head in the same impeller, you may have to run this thing at, I don't know, you know 2,000 <laughs> 2, feet per second, which is mechanically impossible. So then you may end up di di dividing the 70,000 feet of head into seven 10-stage uh, uh, compressors, and then you put them all in the shaft, the gas goes from one to the next and out and so on and so on and so on, okay? So the, the amount of head that you are trying to produce in the compressor to a large extent determines you know, how many stages you, you have. Now there are other considerations, but in general, that would be a, a good rule of thumb. And this, oh, sorry, let me go back, sorry. This is the typical scroll for a single stage impeller. You've probably seen pictures of this at some, at, at some point. Okay. It, some people call it a scroll, some call it a collector, the, the same, same thing. Um, this is what we call the back plate, you know, uh, and the impeller, the, 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 the impeller and the shaft basically will go through here. I think I have some pictures here. These are the, the typical flow, uh, flow regimes. This is, again, a, a, you know, a single stage, uh, you know, that you have. So this is a cross section of a, a typical single stage impeller, a, a compressor, I'm sorry. And what you have here would be the guy veins. Now, way back again, you know, um, when you studied co compressor design, you probably heard of the oil equations. Uh, the oil equations basically tell you, you know, how much head you are going to get. And if you do a velocity triangle at the inlet and the exit, you can come up with an equation that tells you basically what the head is, what theoretical head you are going to get. The, at the inlet, the flow may be coming in, you know, right into the inlet of the compressor at an angle. And at the exit, you really don't have much control. I mean, you have no choice. Whatever the, the, the blade exit angle is, that's what you are going to get. But the fact that you have the inlet angle affects the head means that you can use inlet guide veins to control the amount of head. And the point is this, that if you look at the equation, it is what is happening at the exit minus what is happening at the inlet. So if, if, you, have, if you have zero um, angle at the inlet, the, you are subtracting very nothing. And so you get the most head of the compressor 
when you have no uh, sort of tangential component of the, of the velocity at the, at, the, at the inlet. So typically, at the highest applications, higher, higher set applications, this is set so that it faces the flow. It's like the blade just faces the, faces the flow. And as you want to, if you want to reduce the head, then this hydraulic or pneumatic mechanism is used to move the guy there to give it what we call pre-swell. So pre-swell, different, you know, different terms. And uh, the amount of pre-whirl or pre-swell that you put in the gas gives you, you know, lower and lower head. So as you go to higher and higher angles of the guy vein, you get lower and lower head. And, you know, there are, there are conditions under which you may want that. You know, and so, I mean, sometimes for different applications, you know, we get, we get um, requests from customers and go through all the calculations, and there are five different applications. And some require a lot of head, and some not so much head. So by using the guy vein, you can actually control and reach all those operating points. Okay? Yeah. Sure. Okay, sure. A lot of what, sorry? A lot of compressors. Okay, sure. Yes. Single stage or multi stage? Multi stage. Multi stage, okay. And then some two stage applications. Sure. Mm -hmm. The multi stage starts from 25,000 RPM, first stage to 40,000 RPM, the final stage. You can send big volumes of air underground. I'm talking about a mile underground. Okay, let, let me make sure I get this. Or single stage. But, okay, yes. let, let's, let's get the terminology uh, right so that we don't confuse each other. Different peep companies use different terms. So maybe when he's talking about four stages, he means four different sets of compressors. So one big compressor, yeah. air comes in, uh -huh. goes through first stage, okay. then to second stage, it has 25,000, it goes through 30,000, and then 40,000 to the output. How could that be? The compressor is on a certain shaft. The impellers are on a certain shaft, which is being driven by a motor and a gear. So that's one. How the central shaft. Okay. But it's got four four different gears. Oh, four the, different the gears. Gears, yeah. Okay. So okay. there's a central gear. Yes. Which is called a bull gear. Okay. Driven by four different gears. Okay. okay. And each gear drives an impeller at yeah. a certain speed. Yes. Yes. That's how it, yeah. it, it, it's arranged. Yeah. I, I know the type of the type of compressor you're talking about. Yeah. That is a multi-state compressor. All it means is that you have different stages. Now, in a typical multi-state application, you have one shaft, and all the impellers are on it. That's one application. Mm -hmm. The other one, you can have you know, different gears running different parts of the uh, impellers, and so on, at different speeds. Yeah. So I think that's what you're talking about. And then in all the cases, yes. the impellers are all stainless steel materials. OK, again. Do we yeah. have a reason why all the impellers has to be stainless steel? You say why? So why do we have yes. okay. stainless steel okay. materials yes. as the impeller? Yes. Now, in a sense, you're asking the wrong pe person, but I'll answer it. And what I mean by that is this, that I'm an aerodynamicist. However, I work with this pool long enough to know a little bit about the material selection industry for, for, for compressors. So basically, the material you select is, is depend on the gas that you are using. So, um, you know, whether you use 17.4 or whatever type of steel you use, 74 pH or whatever, is dependent on the type of gas that is going through the machine. So when you would come to us, for example, you give us your gas, your, your gas analysis, and then we look at it. For example, if there's hydrogen sulfide in it, it, it requires a different kind of material, and so on and so on. So as I said, I can't go too great in too, into the details of the material selection because that's not my area of expertise. But what I know is that depending upon the type of gas that is going through, you select the right material for this application. Next question is sure. about the difference between the compressor and then the pump. What, oh. I, what I see here yeah. is that uh, it's an impeller with a shaft arrangement. With a what arrangement? With a shaft arrangement. This, this one? Yeah. Okay. And an impeller at the end. Yes. In the mine, yes. the gate. Yes. We use the same arrangement to mm. pump air to go down. Yes. And that's the compressor. Yes. But when we come to pump, the same arrangement yes. we use pump water underground. Yes. We call that pump. Yes. And basically, a pump and <laughs> a pump and a compressor are really the same thing, in a sense. Water is incompressible. So the, 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 the aerodynamics of calculating the performance, I mean, the, of designing a pump, obviously quite different from the aerodynamics of designing a compressor. 
You cannot call a pump a compressor because you cannot compress, uh, I don't compress the water, but that's incompressible. So, in, I mean, conceptually, they're really the same thing. In fact, a lot of companies that went in the compressor business started out as pump, pump companies. At least Chalmers was making pumps, and then, you know, you go into, comp into the compressor business. And the difference is that the air, of course, has, is, is compressible. So, so it's, it's, <laughs> it's pretty much the same thing. It's just that one is, you know, dealing with a compressible fluid, and the other one you are not. And there lies the difference. Okay. I'm sorry? I'm sorry, I'm not, I'm not. Yeah. Okay, yeah, you, I mean, you probably have, you know, fans now. A fan, <laughs> typically, when you say fan, it's also not running at such speeds that you're actually compressing the gas. You know what I mean? So fans are rather low head kind of applications. You know, but again, the principle of fan, compressor, pump, essentially is the same. It's a more a matter of how much compress compressibility that the, the fluid has that you are dealing with, and, and so on. So. Yeah, exactly. So, um, so the, the gas comes in through here. As I said, you may have the uh, guy veins to you know reduce uh, the head or not, and then it goes through here. This is the impeller here, and this is the, this is the diffuser. We call this a diffuser. Now, what, what is happening essentially is that you are trying to increase the static pressure. You know, that's what the compressor does. The, the total pressure, you lose some, because total pressure, you lose it from the friction on the side, on the walls, and stuff like that. But you're, what you're trying to do is to recover some, some static pressure. And as you know from Bernoulli's equation, <laughs> right, from first year fluid mechanics, um, you know, if, if, let's assume you have a certain total pressure. You have static pressure, you have velocity, right, and you call the total pressure, crudely speaking, okay? So if you reduce the velocity and the total pressure is the same, the static pressure has to go up, right? Anybody uh, <laughs> from first year uh, fluid mechanics? Okay, so, so, so essentially what the diffuser does is it's, as you know, when, I mean, as you go out in area, right, the velocity goes down, right? From Q equals uh, V times A. So uh, as you go further and further out, the, open, the area is increasing. So the velocity is going down. And from that equation, simple equation, you end up with high static pressure. And that's what you're trying to recover. That's really what you're after. So then the gas goes out here to what we call the collector or scroll, and then into the, um, the, um, the discharge core. So that's really what it is. Now here, back here, is a, is a bearing package. And again, the, the beauty of the work I, I do is that I am the aerodynamicist and I leave the other things to other people. So <laughs> bearings and bearing you know, selection and stuff like that, I stay away from it because I don't know anything about it. And there are experts who do that, and we are a team. There are mechanical people, there are aerodynamicists, there are bearing people who do rotor dynamics and stuff like that, and we stay out of each other's way. <laughs> <laughs> so, okay, so this, this is the, 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 um, the inlet, inlet nozzle as, uh, you know, that I pointed out, uh, sorry. Now, let, let me just spend a little bit of time on this because uh, the point I want to emphasize is that very often, because we ourselves don't make a lot of things, we think things like this are very, very, very complicated in terms of analysis that goes into them. The truth of the matter is, they, they, they are not. So for example, how, does that, how do you design a scroll like this? Okay, what you got is you got the gas coming off the impellers, right? Into this into these chambers here, right? So the, the impeller is spinning, and the gases are coming off the blades, and they're collected in this thing here, okay? But in the meantime, I mean, at each location, fluid is coming off the impellers, but fluid has also collected in here, okay? So in a sense, you have two different velocities, right? The velocity of the gas coming off the, of the impeller is determined by the aerodynamics of the impeller. I mean, whether the, cone is, whether the scroll is there or not, you still gonna get certain uh, uh, velocity coming off the impeller. However, depending upon the size of this, the velocity in that could be either very high if it's very narrow, or very slow if it's very wide. 
And if you, you know, the, the example I always use to explain how you design a scroll is like the freeway. So think of the freeway. You have an on-ramp, okay? So cars are going less than 60 miles per hour. And if you are merging at 60 miles per hour, everybody is happy. Everybody is, you know, smooth, transition, and so on. But imagine that everybody is going at 60 miles per hour, and they come on at 90 miles per hour. <laughs> You're going to crash into people, right? A very inefficient process. And it's essentially, that's what the scroll is. If the velocity of the gas in this scroll, okay, differs greatly from the velocity of the gas coming off the blades, it's a very inefficient process. On the other hand, to use the other example, if everybody's going at 60 miles per hour, and then you are like a little old lady going on a Sunday drive, and you are going at you know, 15 miles per hour to the freeway, everybody backs up behind you, they are blowing their horn, and it's also very, very inefficient. So we, call, we say you have good scroll matching when the velocity coming off the impeller is the same as the velocity in the scroll. Now, as you can see, the velocity in the scroll will vary, right? So what we do is we simply take the 360 degree point. And say, so, okay, we're gonna design such that at that point, the velocity at that point of the scroll, okay, matches that which is coming out of the impeller. Because it varies, so we gotta pick a place. <laughs> it's as simple as that. And we call that, we say you have a scroll, scroll match of one. So I, that is what you are trying to shoot for. And then once you have that, Basically, you just do a ratio, you know, of the area distribution from whatever you have here, right? If it's, if it's 360 here and you have, say, 100 um, square feet or 100 square inches, then at 300, it will be 300 divided by 360, that's 100. And so you just do a, a, a distribution, smooth distribution, and that's what you have your scroll. Now, again, you could do all kinds of CFD calculations and so on, but at the end of the day, the difference is, is, is minimal, okay? So then from here, you basically go out, um, and I think it's about a 12 degree angle. And if, again, if you remember from fluid mechanics, you know, there, there is an angle, an optimal angle, at which the flow will not separate. So if you were to go to 20 degrees, the gas will separate. You learn this in fluid mechanics. So whatever you learned, that's what we use. You know, it's, it's I think it's about 12 to 16 degrees where the gas will not separate from, from the side of the wall. You know. Now what you're trying to do again is recover more uh, static pressure. So you want to slow it down as much as possible. But if you just open up, <laughs> the thing will separate from the walls and just get a jet of gas coming out. If you make it too narrow, the velocity will be very high and you're not recovering the static pressure. So again, these are simple uh, met, uh, things that we all know. And that's what actually is used in designing this thing. Now, why can't we do this in Ghana? We can't. The reason is we can't because we don't have any casting capabilities, at least as far as I know. But if we did, almost anybody who's gone through you know, fluid mechanics uh, course could design this. It, it, as I said, when, when you don't do it yourself, it seems complicated. <laughs> the truth of the matter is it isn't. And I just want you guys to have that confidence that what you are learning, you know, you're up there with everybody else. You know, I, if I can get that across, <laughs> I'll be happy. It isn't magic. You know it already. That, that's all it is. So this is, you know, um, we are assembling the compressor now. The guy vein, sorry, the guy vein is here, you know, and as I said, there are hydraulic mechanisms or pneumatic mechanisms that control the, the guy vein setting. Because as you can imagine, the force on the guy vein is quite, quite high. So, you know, you, you cannot do it by hand. Now, I was talking about different types of impellers. This is a radial impeller. And by radial, we mean the gas, the, the blade exit angle is 90 degrees and different, you know, different blade angles um, that can be used. Again, if you remember from the Euler equation, the amount of head, that the head, the ideal head curve, you know, is straight for a 90 degree blade exit angle, and then, you know, it, it kind of slopes as you go to um, lower and lower blade, blade angles, okay? So, if you want extremely high head, you go for a radial impeller. On the other hand, it's not very efficient. And there are reasons for that. And the reason is because the gas is coming in, and it really doesn't reside much, you know, it doesn't have much residence time in the veins. So you don't really have much opportunity to control the, the, the gas. But if you're just looking for a cheap and dirty um, compressor, sometimes in the mines or in a, in a factory, you know, efficiency is not, a, it's not an issue. You know, maybe you've got electri electricity, you generate your own steam, so you have your own electric plant, you may not care. 
So we have the radial impeller, which, as I said, generates a lot of head, again, from the other equation, if you remember. I said I wasn't going to put the equation on the board, but I can mention it. <laughs> and this one is a 30, we call it a 30 degree back slope. Now, this is more efficient. But as I said, you know, if you go back and look at those curves, you'll find that this will not give you as much head at the same tip speed as a real impeller. So if you, if you are looking for efficiency, but not so much head, you'll choose this. And so these are some of the decisions you make as to, okay, what is it that you are going to put into this particular comp uh, comp comp compressor? This is simply, you know, again, a radial impeller, you know, with a shaft and, and so on. Uh, this is just how you assemble it, the scroll is there. You have the back plate with the bearings right here. And again, you come through the plant, you see, you see this going on. Um, similar one, again, I'm not gonna spend a lot of time on this. And so this is the final assembly. You have the motor here, and you have a typical gear here, and, um, and this is a compressor. Now, um, depending upon the country, the motors are 50 or 60 hertz. And so that will determine basically the type of gear that, that you use because you want a certain, a certain tip speed. Okay, so I mean, I think Ghana is 50 hertz? Yeah. yeah. So yeah, it's very, <laughs> there have been times when we've ordered the wrong motto, <laughs> you know, because somebody missed the fact that, I don't know, Thailand or some place has 60 hertz, you know. So it's something we check, we look, we look, because it's very, very expensive. You order the wrong motto, nobody's gonna get it back from you. Uh, again, you know, uh, the complete assembly, you've got the motor, you've got the gear, you've got the compressor. This is a lubrication, lubrication system for the gear. Again, don't ask me anything about the lubrication system because I don't know anything about it. My area is aerodynamics and I try to stay in my lane, as you say. Okay. So now I'll just talk a little bit about multi-stage uh, compressors. And this is, again, the whole complete uh, assembly. Now you, may, you see that it's called a split multi-stage compressor. And there are two types of multi-stage compressors. There's what we call horizontally split, and what we call, some call it vertically split, but the more accurate name, in my view, is a barrel compressor, and I'll explain the differences in a minute. Particular applications for the horizontal split, um, you know, I'm not gonna dwell a lot on that, but this is a typical cross-section of a horizontal split compressor. Now, before I go too far, the horizontal split compressor, typically, the pressures are low, relatively low. I mean, the inlet pressure may be atmospheric, or say 20, 20 PSI and the discharge may be 80, 90, 100. And so basically you have two casings put together and bolted along the joint. And obviously, if you have very, very, very high pressure, that thing can leak. So for these types of applications, we pre typically prefer, um, uh, for low application, I mean for, for horizontal split, we typically like uh, relatively low, low pressures, okay? Now, people spend a lot of time um, designing those bolts and one of the things we have to do to, uh, for customers is to run a leak test. Because if you have chlorine in this machine, you don't want to leak in the plant. So one of the requirements of the whole assembly process is to do a leak test. And there are times when you fail the leak test. Because somebody can then calculate the bolt, you know, the bolt, you know, the number right or whatever. I mean, others after a while, you become quite expert at this kind of thing, but it's important. Every, every you know. So in this case, the gas will come in here, this is the inlet. It comes in here to the first stage. This is what I was uh, talking about. This, this is what I had in mind when you were talking about multi-stage uh, applications. So the gas comes in here, it goes to the first stage here, goes to the diffuser, and it goes to what we call the, the return channel. And what that, that, what that does essentially is to, when the gas comes on the impeller, it has a lot of swirl in it. For it to go in the next stage, remember what I said about diving, see the gas go in the next stage, has any swirl in it, you're not gonna be able to get a lot of head out of it. So the return vanes are to remove all the oil, all the swirl out of it, so that the gas going the next stage is also going axially. And that's really what, what these things are doing. So this gas comes here, and it goes through here, and this is a diffuser, you, you've, take, you've recovered some of the uh, uh, static pressure, and uh, you have your return uh, channel here to take the swirl out, then you go to the next one, and it keeps happening. In this particular case, we actually add some more gas in here. You know, um, you can have a situation where the gas comes in and go, goes all the way through. But there are situations where we can have two inlets, I mean two more, you know, additional size streams into the compressor. Or sometimes you can take some out. <laughs> so the calculation can get quite complicated, but the principles are not really that, 
that, that difference. So you can see that here, we are adding some gas through here. It's kind of narrow, but you can see. So the gas from here mixes with this. Now, depending upon what gas this is, you know, obviously you have two different gases, and you have to do calculations. Uh, there is a software that we used to use called Design2. Um, when I was at the Megama Gas offices, they, they had a different type of um, software, and there are different kinds of software that you can use. To, you know, so you have, you, know, you have this percentage of this gas coming in at this pressure, and so on. And now you got this gas mixing, you know, what is the next, what, what are the constituents of the gas? And sometimes you have knockout, you know, uh, like, not in this particular case, but, you know, if you take the gas out, you cool it and bring it back in, some of the gas, some of the liquids, you know, some of the gas will become liquid and be knocked out. So the gas constituents coming in, coming back, are not the same as what went out. And so you have to calculate that and, because the molecular weight of the gas is very, very important. If you go back to the head, equ head equation, there's an R in there, ZR in there somewhere. R is 1545.3 by, by the mole weight. The mole weight is very important, so you always have to keep track of it. If you do it wrong, you're, you're not going to get the right calculation, the right answer. So then after this mixing, we go through the same process again. And then this is the final collector, scroll, and the gas goes out. And what we have here, which is a quite an interesting mechanical piece, is called the balance piston. And what happens is this, that as the pressure builds throughout the compressor, there's a thrust towards the inlet of the compressor. And ideally, you can use a thrust bearing to take it out. But thrust bearings are expensive. So you want to minimize the, 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 the size of the thrust bearing that you use. And somebody, genius, sometime back somewhere, realized that you can use what they call a balanced piston. And if you look at this carefully, you see that the pressure at the back of this balance piston will be sort of the, the final static pressure, roughly, of the last stage. So you have, say, 140 PSI there. And what you do is you, you, you put a pipe. You, know, you, 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 you take this part of this uh, balance piston and route it to the inlet. So you, you, you put the inlet pressure <laughs> at the back. So now, all of a sudden, you have, I don't know, 120 PSI here and 14 here. But of course, cause it's another th a thrust this way, and so you can, you can minimize the load that the thrust bearing has to take, which allows you to get a cheaper, a cheaper thrust bearing. Yeah. And the gas that is uh, from here, obviously comes in back in here. So in the calculation that we do, you have to take that into account. Now, is the price is inefficient because you are taking the same gas and compressing it twice. So you try to minimize that amount. And what we do, I don't know if it's clear here, but you know, there is a teeth, you know, teeth here, and like a seal here to try to minimize the leakage. And if I very often, when a compressor is not performing properly in the field, what may very well have happened is that the balance piston seal is not working as well. It's, you know, there's, there's something happening and you're just getting a lot of gas right, blowing right past the balance piston, coming back in the inlet. The gas coming to the inlet from the balance piston is hot. So it mixes, if it mixes with the gas coming to the, uh, you know, from the outside, it raises the temperature, and that affects the performance of the compressor. So, okay. So this, this is, uh, in fact, the same compressor, you know, actually being built. And you, you cannot see it from this picture, but these are the two casings, the upper casing, the upper portion of the casing and the lower portion of the casing. And this is the cross-section, the, the, the design of the, of the Impeller, what you call the rotating element. Okay, so in this particular case, these are the various impellers, and you can see there's a bit of a gap here because the gas, I said the gas was, another gas was being brought in, so you need a bit of space in there, you know. So that's what you have here. So this is a typical rotating element, and this is what the rotor dynamics is to work with, because when you are running something like this, I'd say you know 12,000 RPM, there are all kinds of you know rotor dynamic issues, and so they they have uh, software that they use you know, to make sure you don't have this, um, resonance and stuff like that, okay? So this actually is a picture of what you saw. You know, this is um, the same thing. This is the, that little place where the gas is coming back in you know, that, I, uh, that I showed you. Now, again, it may, it may be hard to see. I don't know whether that's the right place to see it, but we have like rings or seals on the impeller you know, because what, is, what, what you don't want to happen is you don't want the gas 
that you know goes out through here to come back here and come back in the inlet. The more recirculation you have inside the compressor, the less efficient it's going to be. So you are trying to seal everything against, you know, and in fact, I don't know whether it's here, but you can see here also. These are actually old rings that we put in there so that when you put the two sides together, you don't get gas flowing up from the you know, high pressure side, I mean, from the high pressure side to the low pressure side. Every seal, every leak inside the compressor has an inefficiency. And there have been times when we build a compressor, we'll test it, the performance is no good. And then you go look inside, and you find that there's a, there are a lot of areas where you are leaking, where there are leaks, and you do your best to fix them. Okay, so this is a balance piece I was talking about. This is the great detail. This is typically made of what we call a braidable material. So it's a material that actually abrades. And so you can sit it very, very tightly against the seals. And so minimize the leakage. And that's all we're trying to do, just minimize the leakage. And we put this step in there because basically the more resistance you can give to the gas that's flowing, you know, the harder it is for the, for the gas to leak. So we put a, a step in there. Uh, these are the impellers. Okay, and now it's been assembled. So the bottom part is here, the top part is there, and we have experts who do this, who do this for a living. Uh, I, I don't do that. <laughs> so yeah, this is, uh, now this was my HCL compressor. The inlet temperature was like minus 100 Celsius. So coming back to what you were talking about, the material that was used for this very first, for the first, because as the gas gets compressed, it, it warms up. But the very first thing you're seeing minus 100 Celsius. And the materials people will tell you what type of material to use. And it doesn't have to be the same to the compressor because it's very expensive material on the first stage. But by the time it gets to the third, fourth stage, the gas has warmed up sufficiently and you may be able to use some cheaper, cheaper material. So the material people are key to what, uh, you know, what we select. I have no say in it. You know. They tell me it doesn't affect the aerodynamics. So, this is, you know, um, a final assembly. Again, you got a motor, you got a gear, and you got a compressor. And this is a sound insulation. Uh, some customers, you know, would ask for a sound blanket to put around the compressor. One of the things that, um, okay, one of the, one of the things that I like to, to say, and this is not, uh, is that when you set, when it's like going to buy a car, if you don't know what you are buying. All you may need is a four-cylinder engine. You got a V8. <laughs> you know what I mean. So when you are going to buy a compressor, you got to educate yourself as to what it is you really want. Because I'll be honest with you. I mean, as vendors, we want to sell you as much as possible. So my point is, for example, if I were to recommend that you get a sound blank blanket, you have to ask yourself: Do you really need it? And if it's close to your offices, you may. If it isn't, you may not. Okay. So all I'm saying is, like like anything. Buyer beware. Just educate yourself as to what it is that you are buying. And make sure you get what is best for your needs and no more, no less. Uh, I mean, this is not something that GE alone does. Every company tries to sell you as much as they can. I mean, it's, you know, it's, it's business. Exactly. <laughs> now, the other type of multi-state compressor is a, uh, a barrel compressor. Now, some call it vertically split. But the whole problem, the problem is this, that when you have an inlet pressure of, say, 1,500 PSI, and a discharge of, say, 1,750, these are high pressures. And, you know, that vertically horizontal split thing will not work because the, the, the bolts will just, you know, it will bounce between the, the, the bolts and you get a lot of leakage. So we have a, a, a different group of compressors that do pretty much the same thing that the other compressors do, but they are designed for very high pressures. And they go into what we call a barrel compressor. And what we do is we have like an inner casing, you know, horizontally split and all of that, you know. And the diaphragms, the diaphragms are the ones with the return passages in them and so on. Again, we split them and uh, then we assemble them like this. So again, you, you saw this. I mean, it's maybe a bit confusing, but it's the same thing you saw in the other one. And then, you know, you ha again, I'll, before I go, this thing here is basically in the inlet because when the gas comes in, if you are not careful, it just go, you know, swirling about. So you put this here to make sure that it does get, you know, like there's an obstacle, so it does get into the inlet, exactly. Um, so we build these things, you know, the same rotating element you saw, and all of this is being built pretty much like the, like the split, right? 
and this is the, sh the shaft again, the rotating element. This is, okay, this is, uh, we'll skip over that. Um, in this particular case, there's a small difference here. I don't know whether you can see it or not. But the seals here are what we call uh, stationary lab labyrinths. So the seals, there are two types of seals. There is a seal where the, the rings are on the impeller, and you have the breathable material sit sitting against it. Or you have a stationary seal right here sitting against a flat surface. This is less efficient because you know you, you don't have you, you don't want your aluminum it's made of aluminum. You don't want the aluminum touch point to touch the, the, the shaft because then they will bend and have a lot of leakage. So you try to minimize you try to have some clearance between the seal and the surface of the impeller. With that breathable, you don't mind because you actually you want it to touch it. So it cuts a groove in and you actually you know can get better performance. But this is cheaper, and so you may opt for this. <laughs> Again, you get what you pay for. Um, so I, yeah, uh, I'll skip this. Uh -huh. So having built that inner bundle, as we call it, there is now an outer casing, okay, which is designed to be ASME pressure pressure uh, coats or whatever. And this whole thing, this bundle that we're talking about, now gets put into that one. Um, and the reason, as I said, there, this is the, the assembly. The reason is because at those very high pressures, you know, you, you got to be a lot more careful about how you put the whole thing together. And these are the people, you know, uh, stuffing it in there. Um, yeah, you just more pictures. Uh, okay. So then, after all this, let me step back. When you come to buy a compressor, you will be offered a performance test. Now the performance test is carried out to what they call the ASME PTC-10. I think it's pressure test code number 10. And there are specific requirements for how this test must be conducted. Where do you put the instrumentation? You know, how much uh, axial length of piping before they lift the compressor? And so, I mean, it's, you know. But the key thing is this, that for example, if you're testing, if you're a chlorine, chlorine compressor, you're not going to test with chlorine <laughs> in a shop. So there the, are, in a sense, gas equivalents. You know, basically, what you're trying to do is to, si is to simulate the performance of this compressor on, on some uh, lower uh, pro pro problem gas. So you, know, you may test on air, for example. You probably wouldn't, if it's a chlorine machine, you probably wouldn't test with air. But there are other gases that you can use that are not as harmful, and you can, you can use those, maybe running the compressor at either higher RPM or lower RPM or whatever. That will, that will be using a dynamic similitude to say that, okay, if I take this gas and run it at this speed, this compressor, the performance will be essentially you know, similar to the chlorine machine. And so very often these tests are not conducted on the actual process gas. Now, if it's an air compressor, it will be the process gas, obviously. Uh, it's a steam compressor, it probably it also be air. But my point is that we have to take this into the test building and run tests on it. And there are specific requirements for how you measure the data, and you know now the, um, that, that's the PTC 10 code. API, the American Petroleum Institute, has requirements for how to determine the, whether the compressor has passed performance or not. And so, for example, in a typical uh, sing, uh, single-speed machine, you are allowed, I believe, five percent excess head. No negative head, it must meet the head requirements, and you can exceed that by about 5%. And the power, I believe, by about 6 or 7. I don't remember exactly now. It's been five years. I'm beginning to forget some of these things. Uh, and so you write the test spec, and you take it to the test building, and you run these tests. And if you don't meet this requirement, you've got a big problem on your hands. And if you don't meet the head, for example, if, if you have 2% below the head, there's almost nothing you can do. Well, you, you can buy a new gear <laughs> and run the compressor faster. But buying a new gear, 12, 12, 20 weeks, an extra, I don't know, $700,000, is not something you want. And so it's, it's, it's something that we try to be very, very careful about. What we will do is we'll design the compressor and add about 4% extra head into it. Because you're talking about castings and stuff like that, that you cannot really predict the, the performance, you know, the surface finish and all those things accurately. So we had about 4%, and uh, we allowed 5%. So if you, you know, if you, if you have 5%, you are fine. Now, if you have, say, 8%, they can trim the impellers. You can actually go in and trim, you know, because as I said, the, um, the head that the compressor produces is proportional to the square of the tip speed. 
So if you, you know, if you are getting too much head, you trim the impeller some, and you can get the head down. But again, it's not something you want to do because it delays it. You know, you have penalties on late delivery and stuff like that, and those things are quite expensive. So we we try to hit it right there, and I think in general we were about 95% uh, there in terms of our performance, which obviously management would prefer 100%. But <laughs> you know, so uh, again, this is the same compressor now finished and uh, out there. In the, um, in, in the field, okay? So this is kind of like, as I said, what you would see if I was taking you through the shop, what, what you'll be seeing. And now I'll leave it to you to ask whatever question you want. If I can answer it, I will. If I can't. <laughs> I think some gentleman back there. Thank you. Yes, um, my question borders on the, we all seen how the aircraft engine works. How the aircraft, aircraft engine, engine. Yes. Merely built by Rolls Royce. Yeah. Right. When you get closer to the aircraft, you see that we have the, it's like an impeller blades. What I'm sorry? The impeller. Yes. The impeller arrangement. Yes. And close the casing like a transducer. Yeah. How different is it from the compressor? How does it work in terms of? Well, uh, remember, in the aircraft, speed. You have an axial compressor. Yep. Yes. We don't we don't make axial compressors. So, but the principle is the same. Basically, any time you can get a blade whirling around and increasing the speed of the gas, you are generating head. Or you are, you know, I mean, I always like to point out that. And let, let me step back. It's important to understand that. And I know this can sound a bit confusing. Compressors don't generate pressure, they generate head. But there's a relationship between, you know, in the equation between head and pressure. You know, there's a P2 over P1 to some power minus one with uh, Z or T, I think, on the top, and so on. So the head is what the compressor is generating, but depending upon the molecular weight and the temperature, you can get a different uh, discharge pressure. So um, we, don't, we don't make uh, axial compressors, but the principles are essentially the same. The axial compressor part you're talking about will be that far end of the flow coefficient range that I was talking about. Yeah. So my question was to ask you whether the two engines, mostly if it's not two, mostly aircraft engines are two, and they are all actually two. You mean on two the different engines? Two yeah. engines. Most yeah, but, but the same engine, but on two different parts of the wing. Is yes. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So sometimes we hear that one engine fails yes. and they're able to go with the other one. The, the, how are the two linked? Are the two linked? No, 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 no. Not as far as I know. Fails. Again, you are really asking the wrong person, but I think, so I, I, I mean, you know, seriously, yeah. I'm a curious person, so I, I think I know the answer to your question. Okay. Basically, the Federal Aviation Agency requires that an aircraft must be able to take off and land on one engine. So the two, I mean the, the two, one of the engines is really redundant. Now obviously, you want the backup, you know what I mean? But the requirement is that it must be able to take off and land, or fly for that matter, on one engine. So when one engine fails, the other one is quite capable of taking it wherever it needs to go. Now, most of the time, the pilot will probably turn around and come and land, because if the other one fails, <laughs> you, are, you are, you know, in the drink. So, yeah. <laughs> okay. So the other question to sure. have is the, yeah. Temperature of the air. Yes. It comes in at the first stage, and before it gets to the final stage, mm -hmm. the temperature has risen to yes. very high temperature. Yes. And then in centrifugal compressors, the, the multi stage ones that we have on the mine, yes. we have what we call intercoolers. Yes, yes, yes. Which, with water, it cools yes. from one stage to the other, to the other. Yes. Stage. But you didn't mention any cooling with the well, air. Well, actually, I, I kind of mentioned it, but in passing. You, the reason you want to cool is because. A hot, hot gas, first of all, they are, you know, if the temperature, for example, rises to 1,500 degrees Fahrenheit, the impellers are not going to handle it. You know, you have to use some sophist less sophisticated materials to, to handle the, the air or whatever gas it is. So obviously, that, you know, you don't want, you, you, you are trying not to make this thing uh, extremely expensive. So you may want to just take the, ga the gas out and cool it and bring it back in because the temperature is simply, simply too high. So the, the depending, I mean, the, uh, the, the, the reason for cooling, essentially, is determined 
by uh, do you want this gas to get as hot? Now take a chlorine comp compressor for example. Chlorine can ignite quite quickly at, ver at relatively high I mean at not relatively at some moderately high temperatures. So in a chlorine machine, basically after so many stages, you take the gas out and cool it and bring it back in. So a decision to cool is not really an aerodynamic de decision. It's more sort of a me a mechanical failure safety type uh, uh, decisions. Okay. My question, my sure. question is, uh, do we have uh, a rotu? I'm sorry? A rotu. A rotu, yeah. yes. Which is all used. Which is what? Which is all used, namely a spare rotu. The mode of, uh, of, uh, of keeping it has been one of the challenges. By keep safe, keeping, by it, keeping safe. it safe. Yes. Uh, if you don't keep it well, it will bow without having nature on it. Like if the rotor is there, yes. and then you don't turn it yes. with yes. frequency, yes. there will be a bow. Yes, 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 yes. Right. For obvious reasons, because the yeah. weight, yes. There was another rotor which came to us with a, with a casing yes. of which we need to put Nitrogen, nitrogen exactly. With exactly. a certain pressure of about five bar. Exactly. So I was just asking. Yes. What is the difference between that one that we are not turning based on the gases around it than the other one which has no gases that we're supposed to turn? Yeah. And, and this is again one of the things I was saying that when you are going to buy a compressor, you should have some idea of what it is you are buying. And indeed, a cheap customer will come and not want to get this um, casing that is designed for storing the compressor. You know, with nitrogen, you know, and again, I don't know whether they're always nitrogen because you know what you have, the, the gas you put in there should be compatible with the material that you've chosen. And the whole thing is, you don't want this thing to rust and, and, and so on. So we do sell uh, containers where these things are, are supported, and are supported in such a way that they won't burn. You know, so part of the pro of the process, you have to design it and support it in particular locations, and then fill it with nitrogen or some other gas. Again, I'm. That's an area that I, I don't get involved with, but I've seen it, you know, so that it, it can sit there for 10, because all of these things can run for 20 years without any failures. And if this thing just sitting in the shop, you know, in all the humidity and stuff like that, you go to use it, <laughs> it's not going to be usable. So if you had one that wasn't being protected, whoever bought it, you know, I'm sorry? Waxed. Yeah. Okay. Okay, so we have to wax material. Yeah, but that's all you okay. But as I we always have to go and turn it every six months. Yes. Every well because the other one we don't do. We just put it on the vertical. But, but let me ask you, I mean, when you say uh, this thing is, is just sort of sitting on the floor or how are you supporting it? We support it by at the ends. Yes. Well, I, <laughs> that tells you right there, because you've got you've got weights on it, right? So it's gonna move. Yes. If you buy that container, there'll be support systems. Exactly, oh, yeah, or, or vertically, uh, exactly. So it, it's an important point. If you buy a brand new compressor um, and you want a spare rotor, which a lot of uh, uh, customers buy, you want, to, you want to go and, and spend the money to make sure that your spare rotor is, is, is stored properly. Yes, you know, because I said, this thing can sit there for 15 years. And then when you need them, you gotta be able to change them right there and then go, keep going. And if it doesn't work, your plant is sitting there for 18 months, whilst you come to us to, to make a new rotating element for you, you know? Yeah, okay. <laughs> oh yeah, yeah. <laughs> Who said what? Doctor Ousechan. That's also Ousechan. That was in the seventies. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> I hope you remember some of this stuff. <laughs> well, I've, I've taught fluid mechanics for many years at the university. Oh, okay. So well, then you know what I'm talking about. Yeah. You are saying here. Yes. But uh, okay. this is quite practical. In, yeah. Uh, in the air conditioning industry. Yes. CFC eleven. Yes. Was the workhorse. Yes. And then because of the ozone problem. Yes. It was up. Yes. Generation of sure of centrifugal compressors yes. with the lighter gases. Yes. How, are they, how they are able to handle the lighter gases? 
Well, you see, from, from the aerodynamics point of view, I don't really care what gas you give me. What I need are the gas properties. So for example, you know, um, is this something that I can model with say the BWR, uh, I've forgotten, B, uh, I've forgotten what the BWR stands for, it's, uh, you know, or, or Lee Kessler. You know, there are different ways of modeling the properties of the gas. Uh, you know, there are different models. Lee Kessler is one, BWR, I just don't, I mean, I know what the B and W and R stands for, I just use BWR for so long, I've forgotten what the, you know. But there are different um, models, you know, for, for telling me what the K, Z, and more weight are at different temperatures and pressures, okay? So, so long as we get that from the cost, from the gas, um, the one who developed the gas. I think that the, the new uh, refrigerants were developed by, I think, DuPont, you know, and they will give you that information. So when, when we have that, then that gets built into our models. So we don't really ourselves care almost what the gas is. If you tell me this is RF or whatever, 132A or whatever, and it's in, my, it's in my database, I can, I can model it, I can get my K, Z, more weight, and I can do my calculations. Yeah. yeah. I, I agree with you, but uh, the, CF, the CFC that was has a high molecular weight. Yeah. When you are using a lighter, a lighter refrigerant, mm -hmm. how does it impact? Oh, oh okay, no, no, I, I see what you're saying. Yeah. So what you're saying is, you've built a compressor, and b let's say it's based on uh, the maybe, you know, one particular type of, 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 of gas. Now of a sudden, that has been outlawed and you get a different one, right? And then say, great for us. <laughs> because indeed, you cannot, you cannot simply take um, you know, a, a gas with a molecular weight of say 60 and run it through a compressor that I designed for a, a gas with a molecular weight of say 14. You can't. So if that's what is going, if that's what's happening, then you pretty much have to come and have a design and you a compressor. Yeah, it's as simple as that. Say that on, for example, the, the speed. Oh, yes. What are the limitations of the speed on the. Okay, it's a good question. Yeah. The, the limitations, again, are mechanical in the sense that I was talking about the, the, the cover flying off, for example, you know, and most multi stage compressors have covers. And the reason they have covers is it's a lot easier to assemble the compressor when you have the cover and you can make sure that it's, you know, so far away from something else. If, they are, if it's open, it's harder. Uh, you know, I won't go into details, but it's harder to build a multi-state compressor with, uh, op with uh, open impellers than, than uh, you know. So most multi-state compressors, maybe the first thing will be open, but the others will, will be covered. And so there are certain tip speed limitations that uh, are, are built into the, to the material that you are going to be using. So, excuse me. So if, for example, the, the, the tip speed is 1100 feet per second for this particular material, but then you have this new gas which requires 1400 feet per second, right? Then what you may have to do is go to more stages. You have to, you know, maybe you had a five stage machine, and you have to go to seven. But the fact of the matter is, that the rules are essentially the same, they don't change. What, is, what you have to do is look at the conditions you have and design, you know, the machine to meet those requirements, making sure that they are me it's mechanically safe and so on. So I, I don't know if that answered your question. Yeah, go ahead. No, 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 I'm, I'm, you know, that's why I'm here. <laughs> I, I'm, leaving, I'm, leaving, I'm leaving on the 13th, so we can, we can take this all the way to the 13th, and it wouldn't matter. <laughs> can you throw a little light on sure. surges and stall problems ah, in the yeah. Yes, very, very good question. Basically, a compressor operates from one end of a performance curve to the other. And uh, uh, what is it? There's a surge and there's stone wall, or, or what was the term used? The stone wall. Yeah, 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 yeah. Basically, stone walling, or the, there's another term for it, I'm trying to remember the name. But stone walling is basically when the performance curve just go, drops off like this. And so it's a, it's a Mach number issue. Basically, as you know from aerodynamics, when the Mach number reaches one, inside the throat of a nozzle, you cannot pass any more flow. Choking, that's the word I was looking for. You can either call it choking, or you can call it stone wall. Now the stone wall, the name comes from the fact that when you look at the performance curve, it's pew, you know, <laughs> so it's like it's just dropping, you know, it's, it just can't go anymore. And so, um, basically, uh, you've reached mark number one in, the, in somewhere in the, in the compressor, 
and it cannot pass in the more flow through. So the performance curve cannot, the Q cannot go any further. So that's, that's that one end of the compressor. As you come to the left side of the compressor, as you reduce the flow, you can go into, into, into surge. And surge basically means that you are trying to get too much pressure out of this thing. And the gas, you know, by the flow, I mean, you don't have a lot of flow. Okay, so remember, now you design this compressor for what I call the middle part of the performance curve. And so if you are reducing the flow, it means that the, the Q, I mean, the, the vertical component of velocity is dropping, right? because the flow is, is, is going down. But the tangential component is not, because it just comes out of the, out of the swell of the impeller. So now, instead of the velocity, the absolute velocity being like this, it's like this. And so you can have a situation where the gas is basically just churning inside this, the diffusers. And some may come out, some may not. But in a situation like that, you are trying to force gas in there. This thing is basically not really going out. But what may happen is, temporarily, it may just go out and then come back in again. And so you end up with this sort of vibration that is a result of you know, very low flows, and the gas just basically kind of going in and coming back, going in, it's called surging. And you actually hear this in the test tank. You know, and you do that, you do that for a while, the compressor will, 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 will be damaged. So it's not something you want to get into. So when we, test the, when, when we design the compressor, we first of all predict where the surge line is going to be and where Stonewall is going to be. And if I remember, I think API requires that whatever number you for flow you put down for uh, surge, you must not, how does the thing go? You must be within 10% of it. Let, let, me, let me make sure I'm getting this thing right. So if, let's say we say 2,000 CFM is the surge that we predict. Yes, you, you, you must be within 10% of it because it's easy to, you know, to be conservative and say, okay, even though I know it's going to be 2,000, I'm going to make it to 1,200, you know what I mean? And the customer is not going to like that because, you know, they want as much range to this compressor as possible. And we also want to impress the customer because the customer, if you go to the customer and say, you know, this is, uh, my compressor has a huge range, it means he's probably going to prefer your com compressor because it means he can use it all over the place. So there's a, there's a temptation to kind of, you know, <laughs> to spread, yeah, exactly. Uh, so API basically puts limits on this kind of shenanigans and says, okay, whatever you predict, you must be within 10% of it. Now, one of the things that I would like to impress on all of you is this. API has certain guarantees, but they are not required. Customers can take exceptions to almost any guarantee in the API specs. And if you sign off on it, we, we love people like that. Because, <laughs> because it makes my life a lot easier. So when you are buying a compressor, look through the API specs. I think it's API 617. I don't know whether the seventh edition or what edition they have now. Yes. There are mechanical guarantees and there are aerodynamic guarantees. Again, I don't worry my head about the mechanical guarantees, but they have to do with vibrations and all kinds of things like that. I worry about the aerodynamic guarantees of performance, you know, how much head, extra head power and stuff like that, where the surge margin is, where the stone wall line is. The slope of the curve, actually, you know, um, because the control engineers who have to control the compressor, you know, they like curves that are high, not highly sloped, because then for the slightest change in volume, there's a significant, there's a change in pressure, and they can use that to control the compressor. If the com if the curve is very flat, it means the flow can change, be changing, and the discharge pressure isn't changing, so it's very difficult to, to control. So there are all kinds of so some customers will come and say, okay, we want you know, what they call a head rise to surge of say 5%. They want that curve to be rising to the point of surge 5%. Five, 5 Some who don't know, don't ask for it. And we design a compressor and it's 2% and you know, they may not be happy, but they didn't, they didn't take, they, you know, so all I'm trying to get at, you know, part of the reason I want to do this is that I want to make sure that at least Ghanaian engineers are aware of some of these things because I've, I've sat in meetings too often with and I, I hope you won't take an offense, with people from third world countries who are not very familiar with these things. And they sign off on things that they really shouldn't sign off on. You can't blame them, they, they, they don't really know. But, you know, uh, if, if my mother went to buy a car, <laughs> she'd be taking it for a ride, you know what I mean? <laughs> so, so there are all kinds of things in the API specs that you should familiarize yourself with if you're in the compressor business. And make sure that if, you take a, if, if your customer is taking exception to it, you, you agree and understand why they are taking exception 
and you are buying off on it, and you make sure that you are happy that you know you, you have reason, good reason for for, for accepting the, the, the exception they are taking. Okay. Uh, Joe, this changing the subject. No problem. No problem. Uh, we've had a discussion on this thing. You are passionate about the fact that. Expert at building motors. Yes. In Ghana. Yes. You know, and I want you to comment on. We've had a discussion on this. Uh, yes. Yeah. Yes. Basically, um, and this is this is not to do with compressors specifically. But things I have learned is that to be an industrial country, all the um, what I call the foundational technologies. Okay. And for example, take electric motors. There's almost nothing that doesn't have an electric, electric motor in it. Your computer, your desktop computer has an electric motor in it that drives a fan. You know? And so there are certain technologies that are foundational. Electric motor, uh, internal combustion engine, that, that technology anyway. Uh, in my view, drive belts be one of them. I mean, every car in this country has three or four. They may be different, Toyota, Honda, whatever. And if it, so if, if, I had, if I was in charge of industrializing the country, one of the things I will look for will be companies that will come in and help us establish those foundational technologies. Because if you make, if you can make, say, uh, a two-stroke engine, you can make lawn mowers. I mean, it's a simple thing to attach a lawnmower to, 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 to this thing. And if you can make electric motors, there's a whole lot of things that you can make. So to the extent that we can push for those foundational technologies, you know, if we don't have them, we are going nowhere. That's a fact. So I, is that what you were? Yeah. So, and I mean, I, I just gave two or three, but if you think about it, you know, now I am a mechanical engineer, so I'm talking those things. I'm sure the electrical people will tell you about chips, whatever chips they use, not, not potato chips, if you know what I mean. <laughs> yeah, uh, whatever, you know, they, they, they are technologies that they would consider foundational, that I don't know anything about. But in mechanical, there are certain things that once you have them, you know, you, you, you are in a position to do a whole lot of things. Again, you know, if you, I'm sorry. Yeah, if, if you are making, you know, again, you know, the simple two-stroke engines, for example, you know, you can make chainsaws, you can make lawn mowers, you know, and so on and so on and so on. A whole bunch of things you can make. So, um, oh, there is Victor. Also. <laughs> so to the extent that we can, we can encourage, you know, those kinds of industries to come to Ghana, you know. I, will just say something that bothers me a lot. And I don't live here, so I, I can say it and go away. <laughs> you know, too often we think, and, and I'll be honest with you, I'm not trying to criticize anybody, but recently I read that uh, the Chinese truck company is coming to assemble trucks in Ghana. Yeah. And so I read that the article, and they're coming to build like 1,800 trucks a year. You divide that by 360, or three, whatever, and that's like three or four trucks a year. Which means basically they are coming to assemble these things in, in, in West Africa. What are you guys really going to learn about truck design and manufacturing from a place where they assemble three or four trucks a year? Now, I realize that we need jobs, so there is that motivation. But as engineers, you know, I would say that when you hear something like this, to the extent that you can go to somebody and say, okay, wait, 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 you know, what are the engineers going to get from this? And you know, we had a conference in Pedroasi recently, and I was one, one of the presenters. And the key thing, again, I don't want to go over all of that, but the key thing that I would like to get across to the engineers here is, whenever you hear about you know, industrial po industrialization policy, Mazda is coming to assemble cars, whatever, the first question you should ask is, what is the need for us engineers? What are we going to learn from this whole process? If all we are going to be doing is standing there and having these things assembled by, you know, five city a day workers, and we just make sure they come to work, you know, we pick, pick our paycheck at the end of the month, at the end of the day, we would have learned nothing. So we need to start insisting that we be in on the ground floor, at the bottom part, where they actually, there's a, there's a, a car manufacturing plant in Marysville, Ohio, by Honda. And the steel comes in as rolled steel. You know what I mean? Rolled steel. <laughs> and it, I've come in other and our cars. So somebody has to sit down and design this car and design the manufacturing process and so on and so on and so on. 
And those engineers are very good. I mean, they, they feel proud. You know, they, they, they know their material. If all we are doing is they knock them down in Japan and bring them, we bought them together, we will never grow. I'm serious about it. So to the extent that you have any impact on any of this, make sure that when they are making these decisions, at the very least, have them take you to China or wherever they are and be involved with, you know, whatever it is they are doing, you know, the, the, the manufacturing plant. How are they setting it up, you know? Because how you set up the manufacturing plant is also another of the things that we engineers need to do. But if they bring the drawings and just set everything up and you just are working there as, you know, <laughs> Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Kushank. I think it's been an eye-opening lecture this evening. And I see my our colleague civil engineers have also enjoyed this, this evening. A few things I have learned. One of the things one of my fluid lectures uh, said while we were in school was that all these equations you are learning, you may never use them throughout your life. He said it openly, but he said the day your employer calls upon you to deploy any of these equations and you are unable to apply it, you should be fired. <laughs> that was Dr. Anson. He said you may never use these equations, but the day your employer calls upon you to use it and you are unable to use it, you should be fired because that is the reason you are being paid. It's because of the, what you know. So the day he calls upon you to deploy any of those equations, you are unable to deploy them. You should be fired. So I think I want to thank the, Dr. Kushan for reminding us about the equations. We'll go back and, and revise our notes this evening. <laughs> but most importantly, as people in the field, one of the things that comes up a lot for many of us will be factory acceptance testing. And some of the things that have been shown here, like he rightly said, sometimes you go and we sign off on things that we don't understand. All we are interested in is per diem. We go, we sit there, they show us the document, factory acceptance test, we sign off, giddy, giddy, giddy. then we have to go and shop, then we come back. We come back, the plans don't work. Then we say, oh, but they produced the thing. Everything was fine. Oh, then there must be a problem. We have to go back again and talk to them. I think that it is important that we take the time to understand the things that we are going to sign off on whenever we are going for factory acceptance tests. Because that is critical. That is value for money. This is where those judgments have to be made. What kind of test is going to be done? What are the values that I should accept and what should I reject? These are the important things. Don't just be looking at the per diem ahead and forget about the technical work that needs to be done. Because that is what you are being paid for. And these are the things that we must display that we understand and our employers will look up and say, yes, he went, he signed off, the things came back, they worked well. But when it comes back and it doesn't work well, the next day your employer is going to be looking at you and say, is this guy really worth paying for? And I think that that will be a disgrace to us as practicing engineers. And we need to set up and challenge some of these things. So thank you very much, Dr. Krushang. And from here we have a little refreshment, but most importantly for the mechanicals and for all of you again, we will invite you. We are hoping to have a series of dialogues which we call the indoor air quality dialogues. As we sit here, for those of you who are technically minded in terms of uh, uh, heating, ventilation, and air conditioning systems, you will know that this is not right. What we have here is not right, technically. I won't tell our civil friends because they don't know, so we won't tell them now. <laughs> but we invite you we want you to attend the dialogues so that you will understand <laughs> we want you to attend and our, our chemical friends and our electrical friends we want you to attend so that you understand the issues of indoor air quality and what it involves and how things should be done properly so that our health can be better protected so please look out for the dialogues that will become up in terms of indoor air quality so that you can engage with us and we all better understand the situation so that we can improve the indoor quality of air that we have in this country. Thank you very much. And unless the executive director has something to say. No, no, just to say a very big thank you to especially our members who came in respectable numbers. Perhaps we give ourselves another clap of it. And on behalf of the president and the council, to profusely thank 
Joseph Odate Krishank. <laughs> um, and again, I think it's important what Michael hit on. The quality of our engineers and being a stickler to our th ethics and principle. Most often than not, we are very quick to blame the politicians. Everything else is politicians. But it is we, the technical people, who have to sign up. And we have to remain strong and steadfast to our own code of conduct and our ethics. And I want to assure you that an institution is your backbone to support you when you face challenges. That is just my short summary. Thank you very much for coming. And let's see you once again. Uh, I'm a civil, so I have to say something. Next week also we'll have uh, an evening session uh, on the 13th, I believe. A little cocktail after that on the geotechnical side. So those of you, uh, everybody can come. Today I've learned a, new, a lot of new things, listening to compressors and Dr. Krishank. And uh, we expect all of you to join us. And we, once we have the numbers, then the institution will be having more blood in our system and will be taking our rightful place in national affairs. Thank you very much for this occasion. Thank you so much. Yep, the refreshment is downstairs, so uh, let's mingle about Engineers are supposed to be low on social skills, so let's improve that <laughs> interpersonal skills. Yes, I was, I was telling uh, Pablo a few minutes ago that civil should attend mechanical programs. Similarly, mechanical should attend civils, electricals, chemicals, and all that. Because sometimes when you are being introduced in the social garden, they don't say you are a civil engineer, they say he's an engineer. So somebody walks to you and says, oh, my house is doing this. What are you going to say? You are a mechanical engineer, but if you know a little about it, you can share so it is important that you cut across. Don't just sit in your silo and say, oh, ask for me, I'm an electrical engineer. So mechanicals are doing our go. Electricals are doing our go. I think it's important that at this age, we learn across. We begin to learn from each other because you, you may learn something that you'll be able to help each other with. Thank you very much. Let's go down there and socialize now. <laughs>